That's my handwriting. <clears throat> okay, welcome to the illusion of animation. Um, yes, this will be interesting. Uh, there was a talk this morning that had like a song and a wardrobe change and like I'm, my mind was blown. So now I feel like I don't have a song. I don't have a solo. I got nothing. Uh, yeah, I know. I know. But I'm going to try. I'm going to try. All right. Yeah, exactly. So uh, just an introduction. My name is Hjalti Helmerson and uh, I'm an animator. I worked on a lot of different stuff. Uh, this is some of the stuff that I worked on for the past four years. Um, I've done other stuff also, uh, but just one thing to look at is like the variety of different kind of animation styles or whatever that I've done. Um, I wanna have this talk a little bit more from the perspective of kind of the human brain and uh, it gets a little bit funky. I know, I don't know, this is gonna be kind of weird. Uh, but um, using you know, the, the mechanisms of the brain, like uh, per, uh, pareidolia and apophenia, so it's, it's the kind of human tendency, of the, uh, the tendency of the human brain to kind of create all kinds of patterns out of random visual or auditory stimuli. I'm just going for auditory this time. Uh, and then apophenia is kind of connecting those things together with things that you already know. So you have funky things, like you'll see you know, faces and things that don't have faces. And there's like a particular quote that I wanted to put on a slide, but the text is too heavy. So I'm just saying, while you're roaming around this thing, looking at something that is not any, uh, it doesn't have any resemblance to a human face. Um, there's a universal tendency among mankind to conceive all beings like themselves and to transfer to every object those qualities with which they are familiarly acquainted and of which they are intimately conscious. <laughs> we find... <laughs> thank you. We find human faces in the moon, armies in the clouds, and by natural propensity, if not corrected by experience and reflection, ascribe malice or goodwill to everything that hurts or pleases us. That's David Hume. I tell you, it's, it's a very old quote, but I thought it was very potent and uh, kind of on the nose for this thing. So it's, 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 I'm trying to say that it's from kind of the human experience of looking at animation and all that stuff. Um, and then of course we know that the human brain is just this amazing machine, but it's also, you know, it has kind of um, quirky stuff to, you know, you can, you can kind of look at something and you'll see something that isn't there or, or it'll, um, it'll tell you the wrong kind of information or whatnot. Um, but I don't want to talk about any of these kind of optical illusions or whatnot, but I want to talk about kind of this quirky optical illusion, which is, uh, what you, you know, I would say if I polled you guys, like 99.9% uh, .9 of you guys would say that that's a human face or a representation of a human face. Now, kind of ignore the circle that I drew around it. I mean, that was just kind of to frame it. But really, all you, your brain needs is like two dots and a line. And it's like, ah, human face. Yeah, great. It's like, I'm so familiar with that. And it's uh, great. Um, so uh, we know that it's not a human face though. I mean, a human face looks nothing like that. So what's going on? And also like, can you make some kind of a spectrum where it goes from an actual image of a human face all the way to whatever this is? This is kind of a representation of a human face. So we can do that. We can take like an actual face and we can kind of work our way there. So, uh, of course, there's like hu huge uh, artistic licenses on the way there. You know, you can do it in all kinds of different ways. But, you know, just for the sake of, of whatever. Um, in a lot of studios, and this is just from personal experience, from studios, from ad agencies to uh, marketing companies and whatnot, I keep hearing this one uh, thing, and it kind of, it bugs me a little bit. Um, and it's, it's the fact that you want to have this dialogue. You want to have this dialogue of, uh, about style, about... Uh, it's, I mean, it's called animation, uh, the style of animation or whatever, but it's kind of lumping together both art style and animation style, so both movement and imagery all together, and it's putting it on that one spectrum, and then it's kind of called like, it goes from real, uh, real or reality or whatever to cartoony. And um, it, it's fine. I mean, I, I, I'd rather have that and then have no dialogue, of course. But uh, it just feels like there's something missing because this is like a huge oversimplification of what this is. I mean, it's a, it can be a helpful tool, but this is like in, you know, in the age of enlightenment or whatever, this feels like a stick or, you know, it's like it really is a rudimentary tool. Um, just, you know, just for the sake of clarity, uh, the, this 
field of study is called semiotics. So it's like the studying of uh, uh, symbols and signs and whatnot, and what like how the brain is perceiving it and whatnot. So um, uh, for the sake of this little thought experiment that I have here, I'm gonna have this spectrum go from reality to basically stop at the icon level. An icon is a visual representation of what that thing is. So in this case, it's a face, a human face. Um, in semiotics, it goes further. So it goes into the meaning, which then crosses the boundary to like symbols, which are cultural things like, um, uh, yeah, like, like yeah, like letters. Uh, like, you know, if you, the letter A, there's nothing that says that's A. Ah. You just have to learn it. And then at the same time, F-A-C-E in English, uh, that's face. So you could actually, you know, take that representation of a face. And you could go further and just have the letters face. Uh, but we're going to stop at just the visual representation of the thing is, you know. So, so um, I'm going to use this terminology just because this is going to be my own thought experiment. You can make your own if you want. So I'm going to use my own terminology. So I'm going to go from reality to stylized. But just so you know what I actually mean behind that word. Um, I, I have found that I've been trying to find the right words, but there's always like some cats to them. They've always been used in other ways that I mean for it. So just, just, just so you know. Um, now, if just as a hypothetical, let's say you went, hey, um, what if you didn't go just with two dots in a line? What if you just cherry picked something else? Then you would still see a face, right? Well, not necessarily. I mean, like if you just cherry picked you know, on your way from real face all the way down to a, like a really like scarce representation of a face. If you just cherry picked like one eyebrow and uh, you know under the bridge under the nose and, and one ear, you would get something that is you know it's a simplification of a face, but your brain is going to go I don't really know what that is, or you know maybe it does and you're brilliant. I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> But you know, so for all intents and purposes, I'm going to go a little bit vague in general on this thing. Uh, I'm just going to say this is you know where we're heading. Uh, by the way, if if you took that face at the end um, and you wanted to uh, kind of put more emotion into it or something, so let's say you're just kind of aiming for, uh, yeah, I want to convey this to the brain of the viewer, and I want to add you know a little bit more smirkiness to it or like you know it's, it's like angry but smiling or. So, well, now you have to add more information into it. You have to add more lines and whatnot. So just by the sheer nature of doing that, you're pushing it up that uh, spectrum. And, you know, just, just so you know um, uh, what I'm talking about here. So um, you can all, uh, this might start feeling um, like there's this kind of fuzzy line there at the end, which, which makes it more ungrounded, meaning that if you want some empathy, with that human face, and you, let's say uh, you're, you're, I don't know, you have the drawing of a human face, and you really want to capture that sadness. Well, you have to add more information to get that sadness across. So um, something that is just two dots in a line, it's gonna feel a little bit more ungrounded. I'm not, and I really don't want to put like any value statements on this because ungrounded might be what you're going for. It's, it might be what you, or, or you have a joke, for example, for jokes, uh, really it may not be needed at all. But it's like there is that fuzzy area there that you might just be aware of. And on the flip side, there's also the fuzzy area that is more famous, which is that kind of uncanny valley. So if you're striving towards making, pushing something closer to real, it, um, it has this weird spot where the brain starts accepting that it's real, but then it, instead of saying, oh, this is a character of something, it goes, oh, this is real, but it looks weird. And you know that's that's where that kind of and you know but maybe you know not putting value statements on it maybe you're going for something uncanny and that's great and then you know you you go um, so this is kind of the the spectrum that we're going to work with right now this is like a step by step thought experiment by the way so you know just hang on bear with me okay so we have this thing and so let's say as a hypothetical we just took a uh, cartoon character and we we uh, you, we have Belle here from uh, Beauty and the Beast so let's say um, it's going to be a little bit subjective, a little bit relative, but let's say, you know, she belongs roughly at a midsection there, like the way she looks, the way she's kind of characterized, but like we always identify it's, it's, it's a representation of a human face. So um, what if we just took more and more? And, you know, of course, maybe that means that some other ones 
gets shifted a little bit, so it's a little bit relative to the other examples you have. So let's say you have a few thousands of them. Now it starts getting to be kind of a, an interesting map of the human face and how you can represent it in different ways and whatnot. It's still super one-dimensional, but you know, it's, it's a tool that you can kind of use, though. Um, just, just, uh, just so you know, it doesn't have to be like a, um, you know, one drawing. It doesn't have to be on one spot necessarily. So you could have something that is like on a broader sense designed closer to stylized, but then all the details kind of bleed into more closer to reality. So like, all, you know, from the freckles to the hair to the shading and all that stuff. So you can start adding all these details. Uh, you can do the other way also, where it starts like the overall design feels like closer to, a little bit closer to real, but then the details shift more towards stylized, where they kind of, uh, yeah, anyway, it's a visual representation. Anyway, you got this, um, you got this spectrum. So here's, uh, here's where it gets a bit tricky. Where does this guy belong? Because, like, if you, you know, of course, this is a, this is a little bit of a one-dimensional spectrum. So it's not taking into account a lot of these different variables. So uh, to me, honestly, I mean, you could probably shove him in somewhere, but it just doesn't feel like he belongs there. Um, and one of the reasons is because they've taken some of these uh, elements of the face and distorted it so much that I actually, you know, if I look at it at a glance, like I, I, I have a hard time knowing exactly what is an eye and what is an eyebrow or, you know, it's really all over the place. Um, so here's one element of this thought experiment. So what if you took that kind of spectrum and you threw a couple of examples on it, but then you drew an alternative line that goes into the abstract or the non-representational. So th at the bottom, you have what the brain perceives as a representation of the face, but at the top, it's non-representational. So the brain is like, what? I don't know, I don't know what, what, what that is. Um, this is not like a groundbreaking new thing or whatever. I mean, this is heavily borrowed from uh, Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics. In it, he calls uh, that kind of area at the top the picture plane, which is like totally fine for the point that he's making. I'm making a slightly different point, so that's why I'm adapting my own kind of terminology to it. So just so you understand, what I mean by abstract is non-representational. Um, it's very important that you get that. All right, so, uh, so let's say you have this thing there. Uh, but let's say you have the real face of Ton Rosendal there, and he starts climbing up that ladder closer to the abstract. And as he climbs up, it gets kind of harder and harder <laughs> to identify that thing as a face. Now remember, on your way there, there's all the artistic choices in the world for you to take. Uh, but you know this is like uh, this is also a bit of a simplification. But just remember that it's not taking away any of your freedoms as an artist, like how you take that path. Uh, so what this is is just like kind of a shitty example. Uh, but just so you get it. Uh, now there's this problem that if you go really high up, at some point it starts getting kind of confusing. And I am using dotted lines for this, uh, but it is more fuzzy, of course it gets kind of confusing just to kind of the average human brain. And then at some point, it's just like super confusing and you don't know what's going on. So it's, uh, well, I kind of call it like disconnected and then confusing, um, which is fine. Maybe that's what you're going for, not putting any value uh, statements on this thing. Uh, and then you can flesh out kind of from stylized to abstract. And you can see kind of how the same thing, totally same thing applies there. And uh, if we kind of flesh out the midsection. So uh, I'm not going to do it like last year and rush it. So I'm just going to allow you to look at it a little bit, kind of take it in. OK, cool, cool, cool. Um, now, human brain looking at this, <laughs> cute little guy. He, uh, the point I'm trying to make with the non-representational and representational at the bottom is that it's that, but it's like how the brain is con um, working hard at making the full um, idea and kind of capturing the full idea of what it is. So the higher you go up, the more non-representational it is, which means that the brain has to work harder to understand what is going on there, which means it needs to use more of its imagination. So it's you know, a bit of a pros and cons. At the bottom, if you go further down, 
it's way easier to know what it is, but it's being a little bit spoon-fed all the information. So it, it may not be as interesting. Okay, so you know, just, just so you know, that is, so I, I didn't do the dotted line at the bottom, but it's like if you go too far in any direction, just like anything in life, if you do too much of anything, it may not be the result that you want, just as a healthy reminder. Anyway, let's do a nice visual representation of this kind of a triangle thing that we have. So we got reality, we got stylized, and then we got abstract. So we got the kind of landmarks of this weird triangular map that we're drawing. So we got kind of the uncanny valley over there. We got the ungrounded, which just feels like it's really far away from reality. And you know, it, it doesn't mean that it's not conveying what you need, but like if you need to really convey a lot of empathy or whatever, it may need, you may need to go a little bit further into reality. Uh, and the abstract, it becomes kind of disconnected and then very confusing if you go too far. Okay, so that's uh, that's kind of interesting, and it and you can tell uh, that this you know of course this is a weird representation of the, the entire um, uh, very complicated topic of like art style and whatnot, but it forms kind of a sweet spot in the middle, kinda. Uh, don't go for just the sweet spot just because I, I'm telling you to. It's uh, you know be more interesting than that. Um, so here is just you know that that kind of those examples put on top, and. It's, it's interesting, it's interesting. So uh, let's go back to our little guy there, Popeye. Um, where does he belong? I would say he definitely does not belong at the bottom line between like reality and stylized, because that's like really where the brain should just easily identify as a human face. So I would say, you know, and this is also where it gets a little bit subjective because I am the one uh, very late at night ha that has to like fill in this map. Um, I'd say it's like closer to between like after and stylized, like kind of far away from reality. Uh, and then, you know, you can take, like, other characters. So you can take, like, you know, uh, Miguel from Coco. And, and he's, you know, closer to kind of reality, but kind of his details bleed into reality. And you can take, I think, uh, I think it's Chowder, if I remember correctly, from Cotton Network or something. Um, um, the, like, the details of him bleed into the abstract. You, you may not notice it there, but he has, like, funky details that uh, if he actually moved, it doesn't move with him, so it becomes this weird abstract thing. But it's, it's kind of cool. Uh, anyway, let's say we have some, somebody that's more self-contained in, in its style, so like SpongeBob SquarePants, everybody knows him. So what if we have that idea of like bleeding a little bit more of the details into reality, but we take it like super far? So we have something like this, you know? And so, and you know, maybe that's what you're going for. So no value statements on my part, but you know, just be aware that, you know, if you take something too far, it's, it gets kind of weird. Uh, and we had a little bit of that issue uh, when we were doing the Agent 327 uh, film, the short film. It's that we were basing it off a character that th in its style, and its design, it was a little bit further up in the abstract. Meaning that it, in a 2D, totally flat re representation, there were all these different lines and your brain kind of just used its imagination. Yeah, yeah, it's fine, it's fine. That is probably an eyebrow or whatever. But if you had to flesh that out, there are like lines there. You have no idea if that is really an eyebrow or it's like a swelling or something, you know, you're not sure. But it works fine for the comics and it actually becomes a little bit endearing. But the problem is you kind of flesh it out. And you know, this, this is like attempts by us, but also by other people of like just flashing it out. And it's not like one is like the one or whatever, but it's just, it's just a demonstration that there are many ways of tackling this. So there's still like all that artistic freedom. Uh, but the end result, I'm, I'm actually quite ha uh, happy with it. Um, it was a long process of like tweaking, 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 tweaking. But I think at the end, what we came up with, we had shifted the entire basic idea of his design and then from there had a smaller bleed into reality, uh, which was easier. Uh, it wasn't a very conscious thing, it was something that kind of evolved. Uh, so, I've talked about this triangle uh, for the image, for the art style. So, what if you applied this to motion? This is where the whole animation thing comes in, by the way. I'm, I'm not just talking about like art style, that's not even my field or anything. Um, but that, this is where like the crazy really kicks in, so hold on. Uh, okay, so what if we took this and we applied it to the animation style? So like how, how would that even work? And if I gave you examples within this triangle, first of all, it needs to fit 
Uh, it needs to be in motion. It needs to not be like a character or whatever, because then you're just like thinking about the visuals of a character and thinking about the art style or whatever. So I, I took our one true hero, the default cube, and I just simulated him falling down. Very basic. Thanks for that one applause. Yes. <laughs> So it's just simulated falling down. Very basic, very easy, you know, and it's, apparently it's very lightweight. I, I didn't change the, 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 the gravity too much. So what if, it's so hypothetical, if that is reality, what if I made something that's maybe like at a halfway point between reality and stylized, but I want to use few variables uh, because, uh, you know, the more variables you use, the more the point will not get across. So I'm just more or less playing with um, squash and stretch and then spacing. Uh, you know, maybe a little bit of this and that. But overall, that's what it is. So I have that thing. And, it, you know, it's interesting. But what if you took it way further into stylized? Like, what would be kind of the cutting off point? And this is a slightly more soft cutting off point than um, in the previous example. But it, I would say, like, any further, and it just becomes, I don't know, ob obnoxious to the brain, like when you're looking at it. It's like style over substance almost. So uh, that's kind of what I came up with. It's just, you know, like it's, it's so ungrounded, like you can't believe that that is an actual thing. Um, so let's just kind of flesh out in between those. And then we have this very interesting spectrum from reality to stylized. I'm making sure I don't just go to the next slide really quickly. Okay. <laughs> um, so, but what about abstract? Like, how the hell do you take this idea of motion and you push it up into the abstract? Okay, let's go, let's just like revisit the idea that we had for the, the, the art style. So remember, I'm, I wasn't doing it on like the thickness of the line or the fact that this is a triangle now or whatever. It's, it's more based on the human brain. So it's more work needs, needs to use more imagination to figure out what, it, like, what are you trying to convey. And to the bottom, it's easier, but it's also a little bit spoon feeding it. Um, so in order to understand that, let me take you to an example that actually uh, is also from Scott McCloud. Uh, and I take it further than that. So you have two panels. So in the comic book world, so you have the two panels, and then in between them, there's a gutter. So it's a, it's a person or figure that has a top hat, it's holding it, and then in the next panel, it's kind of holding it up in the air. Okay, uh, if your brain looks at that, it'll create motion, essentially, in your own mind, that, that they took their hat and they put it up. So you only have the beginning and you only have the end, so the entire motion only happened in your brain. It had to do some of the work. I mean, it had to use its imagination. Like, how the hell did he do it? Did he do it like this? Did he, like, jump up and do it? Or, you know, there's many multiple ways. But you figured out yourself how he did it. And I bet just about everybody here has their own version of how exactly he did it. Uh, but what if you add a panel in between that just kind of explains it? Okay, so the brain still needs to figure out, like, what happened in between there? But there's less. So... You know, okay, so less imagination, but you explained more exactly what happened. So it's a little bit more spoon feeding, but also uh, less work for the brain. It can be a good thing or a bad thing. Um, but what if, and this is where it kind of kicks in also, uh, it's not just about the lack of information, it's also misinformation. So what if you threw in something in between that wasn't just a, like a very clear representation of what happened in the motion, but it's more wacky, it's like it's insane. Now your brain is going to look at that and be like, okay, now I've got to work really hard. I've got to figure out what the hell happened. So, so you know, just as a point, it's, it's not just about lack of information. It's, it's also misinformation can, can kind of muddle the whole idea also. So here we have that spectrum. So at the top, you've got more of the lack of information slash misinformation, and then clarity you know, in, in the entire information, how it's, it's conveyed. So it's like more work for the brain, less work for the brain, meaning you, the brain needs to work harder and use its imagination and whatnot, which too far can be confusing. And less work for the brain can be like very passive and feel in animation, at least. It feels kind of swimming almost. Uh, it loses some of its snappiness. 
Uh, but still, you know, no value, no value uh, statements. Okay. Um, and you know, just as a, you know, just throwing the example from the art style in there, it's kind of interesting how it, you know, I'm, I'm just vague enough that it kind of works for that also, if that makes sense. All right, so let's go back to our example, and now here's the question again: How do we walk up from, you know, from that bottom row all the way up to the abstract? Um, we can, I can go, I can go either way with like lack of information and or uh, misinformation. I just chose to do lack of because uh, it was just easier for you guys to probably look at and understand because misinformation gets all over the place. So, and let's go up from the stylized one, uh, just because it's a little bit more visually interesting. So, at a halfway point, something between stylized and abstract. So, you take away some of the information, but notice also there's a level of like. Uh, for the lack of a better word, snappiness to it, because your brain is filling in some of the blanks of what happened. Now, of course, you can then take it all the way to abstract, and it's like first frame, last frame. And you know, like, and your brain needs to be like, okay, I think it fell down, or somebody put it down, or maybe like this entire thing is upside down, and it actually, some, you know, it floats up, or you know, it's uh, it's uh, it's kind of up to your brain and your imagination to fill in what, what the hell happened there. So we can kind of fill the rest of that spectrum from stylus to abstract, and you'll see this kind of very interesting, uh, uh, yeah, this very interesting uh, dynamic going on, like from ultra stylus to very abstract. Uh, but just notice that it's, it's, it's not about frame rate, if that's what you're thinking, um, because of course, if you want to add more information in motion, just by the sheer nature of it, you have to add more frames. Uh, however, taking away frames, it doesn't mean, it's like, it's, as soon as you start talking about it in those terms, you've kind of missed the point. It's about the amount of information that is being put forward to the brain and how much work it needs to do. Uh, so let's fill in from reality to abstract. This is a little bit more visually boring, that's why I didn't include it. And then we can fill in that midsection. I'm going to allow this to just play for a couple of seconds. This was a lot of work. <laughs> like, believe it or not, trying to figure this thing out. Um, and funnily enough, here, just in my infinite wisdom, when I was doing this example, I know that when I do examples that I need to go a little bit extreme with them because they might not be as obvious to other people than to me. Like, I will see the nuances of it, but maybe people aren't used to it. So when I made this thing, and I made this example, uh, the bottom row was 120 frames per second, just to really like get that idea. And then, uh, like yesterday, uh, Andy, my coworker, said, "You know, the projector you're going to show it on is like 50 hertz." <laughs> it's like, ah, that's right. It can only go to like 50 frames. That's right. So yeah, I had to like uh, dumb it down a little bit. But the point still stands. It's just ugh, it's not as clear, basically. So anyway, uh, just, just as a small side note of uh, the lack of information versus misinformation, uh, these two would be in this similar spot, and it's just one has like misinformation in it, and your brain needs to do some work to figure out what exactly happened. Um, anyway, here is when it gets really crazy, this weird thought experiment. Now we've mapped out the art style and the animation style, what if, as a hypothetical, you flipped the animation style, you rotated it, and then spling, you made something like this, which is a weird representational map of both animation style and art style, called the cartoon diamond TM hashtag, cartoon diamond or something, I don't know, like a patent pending. It's, it's just a thought experiment of, of like how do you visually represent a very complicated topic. Okay, so, um, Let's just throw in a couple of examples, see if this thing makes sense at all. Um, so let's take from Coco, for example. You got the art style, and then you got the animation style. And uh, it's kind of interesting. It's, it it kind of uh, mirrors the, the basic uh, design, but then the art style bleeds a little bit more into, into uh, reality. And then on, on the flip side, the animation style kind of bleeds a little bit more into the stylized. And then you got something like this, like My Neighbor Totoro. And in that, it's, it's kind of interesting because in, in some cases, the backdrop actually um, 
gets more fleshed out in like watercolor details or whatever than the actual characters that you're looking at. So, you know, and just representing that by having a smaller blob and it, there's a slight disconnect between that. And, you know, other examples of that disconnect might be the good dinosaur, for example, where the characters are more cartoony or whatever, and then the backgrounds are super real and, and whatnot. So it's, it's interesting. Um, you got Wrangle, which I thought was like an in interesting just a big decision uh, compared to the other stuff. So you have something that bleeds really into reality, but it still has that, it kind of mirrors the animation style, but it just happens to bleed in the opposite direction. And then uh, even stop motion. And this is a great example of something where you do that whole idea of like bleeding the details, like you really see like fingerprints and little things on it, you know, maybe because it's stop motion, but you can, you can do stop motion that's like super clean, by the way, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, but it, it works, uh, it's, it's like that long bleed, it's not to its detriment, it's actually um, makes it a little bit eerie, but that's kind of the point of the film, so it's actually kind of cool. Um, so what if you did something insane it's like, hey, can you come up with an example of something that's super disconnected from the art style to the animation style? So, you know, somebody suggested this to me. So I was like, okay, yeah, this totally has that weird disconnect. Uh, it's a short film, I think, called Going to the Store or something. It's, it's, a, it's super weird. So it's just to prove a point that it's like, I'm not just picking like Pixar movies or whatever. It's just, you can use this for just about anything. So we have this weird map that is representing art style and animation style together in one simple way. Um, and you know, there's a couple of things that I, that I found while doing this. It's that uh, it's very interesting how often there's that mirror effect where it really like complements each other on a similar level. But then maybe there's like that extra element of bleeding in one direction or another. Uh, so as a rule of thumb, if you guys were like, I don't know, doing this or whatever, or like mapping out other projects and figuring out what you want to do, so let's say you had the art style nailed, but you didn't know the animation style, a good starting off point would to, to just mirror it first and then see in what direction to take it. Uh, also, not to put any value judgment on it, but like bleeding really far in one way or the other can look a little bit wonky or weird, or disconnecting it really far can feel a bit wonky weird. Maybe that's what you're going for. That's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Um, now, of course, this is a super complicated topic, and this probably has um, some examples that may not fit perfectly, or it's always going to be a, a visual representation that lacks in some way, just like anything else. So, you know, for example, uh, you know, we have we have a sphere. We live on a globe, but we we represent it usually on a flat surface, and uh, none of these maps are accurate, of course but they are helpful. They just have, uh, these are all official variations, by the way, just so you know. Um, they're, they're still helpful and they're still a great conversation piece to have in the middle of a meeting room and then you can really like point towards things and talk about things. So just kind of a couple of thoughts about this whole weird experiment that I had. Um, first of all, like the human brain is amazing and it wants to do some of the work. Okay, it's amazing, but also optical illusions. Am I right? You know, <laughs> like, okay, it's not, it's not perfect, but it's amazing still. Uh, it wants to do some of the work. Um, if you look at like a sweet spot of what it finds very interesting, it's usually not at the edges of you know the, this kind of visual representation. It's usually somewhere in the middle. But you know, maybe you're going for something else, and that's fine. But just give it. Um, you know, this is also why I say like more frame rate is, is not necessarily, you know, you're kind of missing the point. It's just more is not necessarily always better. It's like, you know, you, you, you have to know what you're going after and what you're going for. And you have to look at it from the perspective of the viewer's brain. Um, this thing says nothing about inherently about quality or exactly how you're going to do it or if you got away with the style or not or if it really complemented your, uh, I guess, goal with your short film or, or feature film or whatever. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a great way to kind of at least get the conversation started, like in a team. Uh, and it's at least, you know, it's always going to be a bit relative and it's always going to be a bit subjective. You know, the more information you pump into it, the more you can kind of figure it out and more accurate it's going to be. But it's at least going to be a little bit better than just a, a line that says real cartoony, and that's it. Um, 
and then you know taking that next step forward, it may be the um, uh, something that helps demystify the illusion of animation. So thank you so much. Was it okay or? Hey, Sorry, but, uh, I just a short remark about the program. Um, the third theater over there was uh, meant to be some kind of hangout where people could do some coding or whatever. It's not being really used. So tomorrow and uh, Saturday, we will do that room within a theater setup to do a live stream from this place because the talks this year are amazing. Everybody wants to see people speaking. Uh, we don't fit all in, but with a good stream in that room, it will be a nice, pleasant experience to also see the talks that are happening in there. Um, there's also a little error in the voting form. Do I have to say something about that? Okay, people will find out what that means. Then I'm done, right? Okay, let's have fun. See you later.